This week, water. It's cool. Hey, welcome to Trial by Science, the show where we take scientific concepts and put them to the test. I'm your host, Dan Fisher, and today we're going to be talking about water. And where better to begin a discussion on water than right here in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, a city practically built on water. It's even got its own river, for crying out loud. But that's not why I'm here. No, no. I'm here to check out one of the coolest science museums the Midwest has to offer. Let's check it out. Yep, Discovery World. One of the coolest places you can go to to learn all about innovation and technology. But the other thing that's heavily emphasized here is water. Roughly half the exhibits in there are devoted to the subject. It's no mistake that the museum is located right on the shore of Lake Michigan. As we will see, there is a lot of attention placed on it and the other Great Lakes. The first such exhibit that captured my attention was this, the Helen Bader Foundation's Great Lakes Future. This is one of the largest interactive models of the Great Lakes anywhere in the world, and there certainly is a lot to do with it. Darken the skies and rain on a rainstorm, or observe the native life of the five Great Lakes. This sky bridge provides a bird's eye view of the Great Lakes, and it is an awesome sight to behold. But there are a number of other exhibits revolving around this one that are also worthy of checking out, and they're located just around the corner. The Scooter Challenge sailed the Great Lakes between 1852 and 1889, and was revolutionary in its design. At 85% the size of the original vessel, this replica is a permanent fixture at Discovery World, and provides visitors a perfect hands-on look at naval life. But the Challenge is not the only schooner on display here. One of Wisconsin's flagships, the sailing vessel Dennis Sullivan, also calls Discovery World home. Summertime visitors can go on a two-hour tour of Lake Michigan on board the Dennis Sullivan. But there's another tour that can be done year-round, and it starts in the museum's lower levels. Let's check it out. The Raymond Aquarium takes visitors on a journey from the Great Lakes to the Florida Keys, along the same path taken by the Dennis Sullivan. Notice the gradual changes in ecosystems along this pathway. Take a walk through an underwater tunnel. Or be a scientist in a submarine lab. But one of my favorite things to check out here is the touch tank, where you can touch sharks, stingrays, and more. And that barely scratches the surface of what you can do and explore at Discovery World. If it's not already on there, make sure to add it to your list of places to visit or revisit. But even if you can't make it out to a science museum like Discovery World, there are plenty of tests that you can do at home to learn more about how water works. Starting with... Let's consider a hypothesis. I think that the rocks skipped across the water because of its forward momentum. Seems like common sense, right? I mean, if I just drop this rock into the water, it will sink straight to the bottom because all the energy is going straight down. But while the rock's energy and direction might have something to do with its skipping, it's not the full story. It also has to do with a property of water called surface tension, which is exactly what it sounds like. See, water is literally tense on the surface. If you've ever done a belly flop at the pool, you know how surface tension feels when you break it. But there are other, less painful ways we can observe surface tension in action. Let's do a test. We are going to make a paperclip float on water. Now for this obviously you need a glass of water, some paper towel, and of course a paperclip. Now if you just try to place the paperclip into the water, it's going to sink because the paperclip is just too dense. If you want to get the paperclip to float, you need to be delicate. But as you can see, even if I try to carefully place the paperclip on the water, it's still going to sink. Unless you've had a lot of practice doing something like this, chances are you're going to need some sort of assistance. And for me, that's a paper towel. So what we're going to do is we're going to take off just a little piece of paper towel and place it on the water surface. Now because the paper towel is pretty lightweight, it should float and theoretically it will support the paper clip's weight. Now you have to do this all fairly quickly. Paper towel will eventually absorb water and get denser and denser and then sink. But when it does, the paper clip should still be floating on the surface. Pretty cool, huh? Let's find out why this happens. Surface tension is closely related to another property of water called cohesion, which means that water molecules like to stick together. Notice that I have two drops of water on this wax paper. Now if I fold the paper so that the water drops collide, they'll merge, becoming one bigger drop. 
And the reason why this happens is very cool. We all know water's chemical formula, two hydrogen atoms bound to one oxygen atom, H2O. Now as the atoms get fused together, something interesting happens. The oxygen takes on a slight electronegative charge, and the hydrogens take on a slight positive charge, kind of like a magnet. In fact, you can think of water molecules as being like mini-magnets. Just how like like charges on a magnet will repel, and opposite charges will attract, the slight negative charge of the oxygen on one water molecule will be attracted to the slight positive charge of a hydrogen on another water molecule. Now, if a water molecule is surrounded by other water molecules, it can be attracted in any direction and be happy. But, if the water lies on the surface, the only molecules it can possibly be attracted to lie next to and underneath it. So they angle themselves down slightly. And it's this downward direction from all the molecules on top that makes the surface slightly taut. Surface tension can be found pretty much anywhere, including the kitchen sink. In fact, the kitchen sink is probably one of the best places to observe the power of surface tension and cohesion. Take a look at this. The attraction between water molecules in this drop is so strong that even though gravity is pulling down on each and every one of them, trying to pull them apart, they are not separating. Which makes me wonder, is there a way we can make water less cohesive? Remember, water molecules are like mini magnets. They have a positive end and a negative end. So when you have a bunch of them together in one place, they're going to attract each other. But water isn't just attracted to itself. There are plenty of other molecules out there that also have these positive and negative ends. Scientists call molecules like these polar molecules. But then of course there are some molecules out there that water just isn't attracted to because they don't have these positive and negative ends. Scientists call molecules like these nonpolar. I wonder if I mix water in with something that's nonpolar like oil, if that will weaken the surface tension. Let's do a test. For this experiment, we're gonna to wanna to have two glasses of water, some cooking oil, and two balls of paper. Make sure it's the same kind of paper and the same size ball. Don't want one to be heavier than the other as that would skew the results. Now, in one of the glasses, I'm gonna pour in just a little bit of oil. And then mix that all together. Now for the experiment. I'm gonna put one of the balls of paper into the glass with pure water. Now, because the paper is relatively light and there's been nothing to disrupt the water surface tension, it should float at the top. And that's floating as expected. Now the question is, when I put the second ball of paper in the oil and water mixture, will it sink or float? My guess is that it will sink. Huh, well that's odd. Why isn't it sinking? Maybe the ball wasn't sinking because the oil and water weren't mixing. I mean, the oil was just sitting on top, so the water surface tension was still there. I think the key to this problem is having a different mixture, and I think I have just the thing. Soap works so well to clean your hands and dishes thanks to chemistry. Here's soap's molecular structure. One side of it is polar and is therefore attracted to water, but the other side is nonpolar. This is the side that wipes away dirt and grease. I think that the polar side of one soap molecule will attach itself to a water molecule, and the nonpolar side will repel all the other water molecules in the area, thus weakening the water's cohesion. Let's test it. And we'll mix it in. And now for the moment of truth. And that is sinking. Yes! So there you have it. Soap can weaken water's cohesion, but it does not eliminate it completely. If it did, then these bubbles would never be able to exist. So far, we've only scratched the surface of all water's properties. Here's another observation for you. Today is an absolutely beautiful summer day. Perfect day for a swim. Okay, okay, so maybe that was a bad idea. In fact, this is a rather extreme version of a test that anybody who lives near a large body of water can do. Simply take the temperature by the water, then go a couple miles inland and take the temperature again. If it's summertime, the water side temperatures will likely be a little cooler than they are inland, and if it's winter, the temperatures will probably be slightly warmer.
You've probably heard the phrase, a watched pot never boils. Obviously that's an exaggeration. It will eventually boil. It just takes a long time. The reason why it takes so long, and the reason why water side temperatures are warmer in winter and cooler in summer, has to do with the property of water called high specific heat. You see, water is very good at storing heat without actually rising in its temperature. It takes a lot of energy to raise the temperature of water, more than pretty much anything else. I've had the heat going on in this pot for a good five minutes now, and even though the water isn't boiling, touching the pot would be extremely painful because its specific heat is much lower than water's. It is a very simple experiment that you can do at home to safely demonstrate this concept. All we need for this test is a heat source and some cups full of things to heat. Oh, and a thermometer. Now, I'm gonna be heating water today, obviously, but I've also got salt and oil, but feel free to test this with whatever you want. Now, it's important that the weights of all the variables be as close to exactly the same as possible. Specific heat is measured by the amount of energy it takes to raise one gram of something one degree Celsius. So it's important that we measure by weight, not volume. Once everything is measured, we're gonna to wanna to take the temperature of each variable. So our water is at 65. Salt is 61. And oil's starting temperature is 68. The important thing here is that each cup receives an equal amount of heat. So for this, you could place light bulbs at equal distances between each cup, or if it's a sunny day like this, just placing them in the windowsill. We're gonna let those sit for an hour before we take the temperatures again. But in the meantime, my good friend Tanner has agreed to help me demonstrate another property of water closely related to high specific heat. It's called high heat of vaporization. Hey Tanner, thank you for helping me demonstrate high heat of vaporization today. You're a good sport. No problem at all, Dan. It's good to be here. What is high heat of vaporization exactly? Well, Tanner, we know that high specific heat means that it takes a lot of energy to raise the temperature of water. High heat of vaporization takes that idea just a step further. It means that it takes a lot of energy to turn water from a liquid to a gas. Okay, now, if that's the case, why are we in a gym? Why aren't we, you know, in a kitchen boiling water or something? Well, you know, we've already been in a kitchen twice this episode, and I kind of want to mix things up a little bit. Besides, the experiment you're going to be doing is much cooler than boiling water. Cooler? How so? What do you mean? Well, I'm going to have you take your temperature. So if you wouldn't mind doing that for me real quick. Sure, why not? That's looking like 97.3, Dan. 97.3, awesome, good number. That's gonna be our baseline. Now, I'm gonna have you work out for about one hour, then we're gonna take your temperature again, see how much has changed. Sound good? Sounds good to me. All right, very good. All right. While he's doing that, let's take a look at the results of our high specific heat experiment. Okay, salt. Current temperature is? 68, starting temperature was 61, so a bit of an increase there. Oil, its starting temperature was 68, and it is now at 71. All right, so now we know that oil has a higher specific heat than salt does, but now the suspenseful part. What will water's temperature change be? Its starting temperature was 65, and it is now 66. So. Unsurprisingly, water had the smallest change of all the variables here. But there's more to this test. What happens when we put them in a cool, dark location? Which one will chill the most? While we wait for those results, let's take a moment to reflect that if high specific heat and high heat of vaporization didn't exist, then neither could life as we know it. Mmm, water. I love it. I can't live without it. No, seriously, I can't live without it. And neither can you. See, you and I, we're mostly made of water. My body's about 60% water, roughly the same as you and everyone you know. And so the fact that these two properties exist, it's not just good news for me, it's good news for all of us. It means our body temperatures are well regulated. Water's high specific heat allows us to be exposed to a variety of temperatures, and it takes time for our temperatures to change. If water had a low specific heat, well, our cells would freeze whenever it got even slightly cold out or boil once it starts getting warm. Water's high specific heat allows us to live in a variety of conditions and climates, as does its high heat of vaporization. But I think that this is just a little too warm for my liking. I gotta find someplace else to visit. Whew, that's better. I was really sweating there. Of course, that's what happens when we get hot. We get sweat, a combination of mostly water and some chemicals. That sweat then evaporates off of our skin and with it goes heat. So sweating then acts as a cooling mechanism for our bodies, and it's a good thing too. If we didn't sweat, then we would overheat and then eventually pass out. 
But when we sweat, we lose water. So it's very important to stay hydrated whenever our body temperatures rise, say when you're in a hot environment or when you're exercising. Speaking of which. Thanks, Dan. No problem, Tanner. But just imagine if water didn't have such a high heat of vaporization. Suddenly, seemingly normal temperatures would be extremely hot to us, and we would be sweating pretty much constantly, and thus our risk of dehydration would go way up. But the importance of these two properties extends well beyond our individual bodies. The building behind me is the Point Beach Nuclear Power Plant in Two Rivers, Wisconsin, and it, like pretty much all nuclear power plants, is built next to a body of water, and for good reason. Now, for security reasons, we can't actually go in there to show you why, but luckily for us, there is a building right next door to it that we can access. The Point Beach Energy Center is a free to the public museum featuring exhibits on not just nuclear power, but also steam, coal, and hydroelectric, just to name a few. Let's go check it out. Our energy experience begins with a history of electricity, along with the first of many interactive exhibits, such as. But the exhibit that I'm most keen to explore is just around the corner. We are inside a miniature version of a nuclear containment structure, and is here where water's cooling properties come into play. This tower in front of me is a nuclear fuel assembly. It contains rods that house uranium fuel pellets. Now the uranium atoms inside these pellets are split apart in a process called fission. And if we step over here, we can see how fission works. Uranium is split when it is struck by a neutron. The split uranium then releases fission products, more neutrons, and heat. A lot of heat. So much heat that if the fuel assembly isn't kept cool, the nuclear plant would go into meltdown. And that would be bad. Very bad. Fortunately, the assembly is kept cool, thanks to water being held in the reactor. At Point Beach, this water is pressurized, which allows it to remain a liquid even at extremely high temperatures. So yeah, yeah, I know, it's kind of a whole cheat on this whole high specific heat idea, but I do think it relates. Water's cooling properties keep this reactor safe. Now the heat from the fission is used to vaporize unpressurized water outside the reactor. The steam that's generated is then used to spin turbines, which in turn generates electricity. The steam then condenses into clean water and is sent back into Lake Michigan, about 20 to 25 degrees warmer than it was when it came in. The Energy Center is open from 11 to 4 on Tuesdays and Fridays and is once again free to the public. You should check it out sometime. Speaking of time, Tanner's workout should be just about over. Let's go see how he's doing. So Tanner, how are you feeling? Pretty good, Dan, pretty good. Excellent, are you feeling tired? Just a little bit. All right, well, hang in there. You only have a few more minutes left to go. Just gonna go find out the results of our other experiment and then we'll check out your temperature. Deal. All right, let's see how they did. After spending an hour in the window, salt had a temperature of 68 degrees and it is now at 64, all right. Oil. Its previous temperature was 71 degrees and it has dropped to 68. Okay. Water now. At a previous temperature of 66, its temperature is now at 65. So water didn't really gain or lose much heat, but the salt and oil did, proving that water has the highest specific heat of, well, at least the things that we've tested here. So Tanner, workout's over. How do you feel? I feel okay, Dan. I feel alright. Good, good. I'm glad to hear it. And before you cool down too much, let's take your temperature once again. Sure. What do you got, Dan? Well, I'll tell you, but first I want you to guess. Would you say your temperature now is higher than it was before or lower? Definitely higher. Definitely higher. Yeah. Why? Because uh, I'm feeling pretty hot. Feeling pretty warm right now. All right. Well, you are correct, good sir. Your temperature originally was 97.3, and you are now at 98.5. So, a little bit of a temperature raise, but not all that much. Mm -hmm. See, the water in your body was acting as a coolant, first by taking a while to heat up, and then once it did heat up, evaporating. Speaking of which, you're probably pretty thirsty right now. Well, Here, man. have some of the sports drink. Thanks, Dan. So, Tanner, how did that taste? Pretty good, pretty good. Good, now if you had to guess, without peeking at the label, how many ingredients would you say are in there? Uh, I don't know, it just kinda tastes like water to me, Dan. Exactly. Obviously, there's a lot more in that drink than just water. In fact, if you let me take a peek at the label, we've got water, but we've also got sugar, dextrose, citric acid, natural and artificial flavor, salt, sodium citrate, 
monopotassium phosphate, modified food starch, glycerol ester of rosin, and blue one. It's a lot of ingredients, Dan. Yeah, I know, right? And you would never think it by just looking at the drink because this, this is a solution. What's the solution? Well, it's, um, it's kind of like a mixture. All right, Dan, what's the difference between a mixture and a solution? It's really hard to explain. It's probably better that I just show you. A mixture is made up of two or more things that are, you guessed it, mixed together. The key though is that once they're all mixed, you should still be able to separate all the elements. Take for instance this bowl. Now I can put a bunch of random things into it like some rocks, some coins, and some screws and nails, and then I can stir it all together. But when it's all said and done, I can still reach in and grab and sort each of the elements. Now a solution also consists of two or more things that are mixed together, but unlike a mixture, you can't separate the parts again because some of them have been dissolved. Okay, so I get that this sports drink is a solution and it has water in it, but why is that important? Oh, it's very important. See, water is very good at dissolving things. So good in fact that it's actually called the universal solvent. Uh, so a solvent is something that dissolves something else. Yeah, exactly. Solvent dissolves other things. It dissolves solutes. So in the sports drink, the water is our solvent. And all the other ingredients that are rattled off are the solutes. And what we end up with is a solution. Remember how earlier in the episode I said that water is a polar molecule? I also said, there are plenty of other molecules out there that also have these positive and negative ends. Turns out that water's attraction to these other polar molecules is so strong that the water will completely surround them and break them apart. Take salt, for example. Salt water is the most abundant solution accessible to us on Earth. Roughly 70% of the planet is covered with water, and 98% of that is salty. And that salt has been completely dissolved. Observe. This table salt has the chemical formula NaCl, one sodium bonded with one chloride. Now the sodium has a positive charge that is attracted to water's oxygen, and the chloride has a negative charge that is attracted to water's hydrogen. And the attraction here is so strong that the water molecules actually break apart the salt. As evidenced here, the salt has been completely dissolved. Now the question I have is, will salt dissolve in something nonpolar like oil? My guess is no. We know from earlier in the episode that water, another polar molecule, doesn't dissolve in oil. So I see no reason why anything should happen to the salt now. But let's test it. And it looks like my hypothesis was correct. The salt is not dissolving in the oil. It's just settling at the bottom. Feel free to test this on all sorts of different things like sugar, sand, or soil. If it dissolves in water, it's probably polar. But water's solvency is responsible for more than just our favorite flavored drinks. It's also given us some of nature's most beautiful natural formations. And you don't have to go very far to find them. I'm here in Blue Mounds, Wisconsin, about 20 miles west of the state's capital, about to visit one of our national natural landmarks, the Cave of the Mounds. This particular cave is over one million years old and was formed when the limestone rock was slowly eaten away by, you guessed it, a water solution. The caves lie anywhere between 40 and 70 feet below the surface, but the story of their formation doesn't begin down there. For that, we need to turn our attention elsewhere. One of the many polar molecules that dissolves in water is carbon dioxide, and there is a lot of it found in the atmosphere. When rain falls to earth, it carries with it some of this dissolved CO2. As the water seeps into the ground, it picks up more and more carbon dioxide. By the time it makes it down to the caves, it's no longer water, but a weak carbonic acid. And it's this acid that dissolves the limestone. At least it used to. These huge cavernous spaces used to be filled with this acidic water. But eventually, the water level dropped, exposing the space to air. Now the water that comes in through the cave's lifeline, a large crack in the ceiling, evaporates leaving behind deposits that, over hundreds of years, develop into the cave's many formations. Cave tours are offered daily year-round, but there's so much more to do and explore. 
We have an orienteering course, we have a letterboxing uh, course, we have a geocache, we have two hiking trails with a trail guide, we have a geologic timeline that's life size that, we, that people can walk along. And much, much more. You know, Cave of the Mounds has been called the jewel box of major American caves, and it's easy to see why. Come visit it sometime and see for yourself water's effect on nature. And with that, it is time to end today's program. And we're better to end things than right back where we started. See, the show is like water. It's cyclical. It flows. Anyway, thank you very much for tuning in. If you liked what you saw today, do us a favor and check us out online. We are on Facebook and Twitter. And we also got ourselves a brand new website, www.trialbyscience.wordpress.com. There you can find out more about the topics discussed in today's program, as well as let us know what you would like to learn more about. And remember, the key to good science is to test things often and from multiple angles, so make sure to send us your results. And with that, that really is the end of today's program. I'm going to stop talking now. Roll credits. <laughs>